it's a it's a, a nice refresh. It, it's not a radical change. It's it's not like we're saying we're the new WETA. We're the same station that you've always known and loved. We've got the same program with the same faces, and you know we're still that legacy that that's here for you. Just a little bit of a facelift, you know, a little bit of a Botox here or there, and uh, you know, that's kind of all it was. Hi guys, welcome to Broadcast Bulletin. I'm Jim Stanton. Hello everyone, I'm Jacob Brooks. Thanks so much for being here. If you haven't already, make sure to go to our website, broadcastbulletinpodcast.com. Check us out on Instagram and TikTok at Broadcast Bulletin. And we're also on Facebook and Twitter as well. Well, our guest on this episode is Dylan Wilbur, who is currently the creative director at WETA, the PBS station in Washington, D.C. Before working at WETA, Dylan was a creative and design director at WUSA in Washington, D.C. That's the Tegna-owned CBS affiliate there, where he led that station's rebrand a few years ago. Dylan's also held, held roles as creative and design directors at various stations across the country, like San Francisco, Minneapolis, Milwaukee, and he got his start way back when I was a little child at WDJT in Milwaukee in 2008, where he was a broadcast designer. So if you're in the DC metro, and you watched WETA, you probably noticed a refreshed logo, branding, and music the past couple of weeks. That's because Dylan was behind all of it. They relaunched uh, in January of this year, January 2nd. So we're going to take a closer look at that rebrand. Some other things Dylan has done over the years, maybe, just maybe we'll get him to share some of his advice and best practices as well. Dylan, we're so happy you said yes to joining us. How are you? Uh, it's been great. It's good to be here, guys. I'm, I'm honored that you asked me. This is, uh, you know, to be on Broadcast Bolton as your first guest. Wait, I'm not your first guest? Okay, okay I'll take it, fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, Dylan, you're awesome, though. No, we're, we're happy to have you, you know, have a creative background on here because we've been doing a lot of, you know, on-air talent, people in news, producers. So now we have someone from the creative services side kind of walk us through that. And you're really exciting for us because uh, you're, you're rebranding a whole station. And for those who don't know, uh, WETA is the main PBS station. They're one of PBS's biggest stations. They produce a lot of programming. You know, if if you watch, you know, the PBS News Hour, then obviously you've watched one of WETA's shows. And then of course, WHUT is the other PBS station there. But you know, more people watch WETA, so we're really excited to have someone of Dylan's caliber on. So we're going to ask him his first question, which is, why creative services? What made you want to just work in broadcast in general? Uh, when did that book bite you? I was a little kid, you know, I, I remember, um, and this is super nerdy, but I, I think I'm talking amongst friends here when it comes to this stuff. I remember, this is probably going to be like 96 or something like that. Uh, the local, one of the local stations in town changed their graphics and I kind of noticed it. And I remember like sketching out the lower thirds with a marker and some construction paper, you know, just like mesmerized by like TV news graphics of all things. I don't know why I was just it's a sad nerdy kid, you know? Um, but that was the dream. It was to get involved in TV in some way. And I really wanted to be a, a meteorologist. That was the real dream. Um, but uh, the, the thought of learning physics and math was, was just too daunting. So, you know, and I thought with this face, maybe we'll just stay behind the scenes and, and um, I never thought it was going to happen. You know, I never thought that uh, people kind of ever get to follow their dreams. I just thought that's something nice to think about. But here we are. I think this is my 15th year working in, in local television. Um, and uh, it's, it's hard to believe. You know, I, I've, I've been truly blessed uh, to, to have what I have. And, and not just to, you know, have a, have a job in this industry, but to have... Um, thrived in it you know i mean I, i've worked at some great places i've met some great people i've done some incredibly exciting projects if you would have talked to this this kid back in high school i would have been very happy working at a print company in west Dallas, you know running the paper mill or something i don't know uh never thought this was going to be where i would be um so yeah no it's, it's just uh it's it's surreal to think about it sometimes all right so you have mentioned working at some great places so tell us what those great places are just walk us through your career with your first stop and up until you know weta now 
Sure. We can go way back. I won't bore you with this one, but my, my very first uh, uh, TV gig was uh, cable access in West Dallas, Wisconsin. I worked for the school district's cable channel. Uh, exciting live broadcast, like school board meetings. You know what I mean? It doesn't get any more exciting than, than, than those or high school football games. Uh, did that for a bit. Was lucky enough that that was a uh, good enough experience to get me in the door at the local CBS station on the morning crew as a uh, floor director, camera operator. Uh, so I worked at WDJT for a couple of years uh, before switching uh, from production to graphics. Uh, I've always kind of had this, this kind of a bit of a knack for graphic design. And, and so you combine that with my love for video production. It was kind of a perfect fit to make that switch to the graphics department. Uh, so I worked at CBS and the graphics team in the morning show for a bit, and then I moved on to the night, uh, the nightly newscasts. Um, it was interesting at that station because uh, the way the set was designed, uh, they had to use an over the shoulder for every single story. So it would cover the shoulder of the anchor who sat next to them because the desk was so tight. Uh, so I was turning out, I don't know, like 50, 60 graphics a night for uh, the different newscasts on WDJT and then uh, they did a newscast for Telemundo, went for the South Bend ABC station, uh, get a nine o'clock show. So I was just turning graphics out left and right. So that, that job taught me how to get really fast at design, to learn shortcuts. There was a sports reporter, uh, Kevin Holden, who's a, a really good friend of mine. And he, he would always forget to submit his graphics requests uh, until sometimes the block before his segment. And it became kind of a game where he would have me like try and build all of his over the shoulders in about like two minutes before he goes on the air and then package him and send him to the control room and the control room folks hated it. I hated it, but it was actually, you know, it was a good practice for me to get, to get fast at it. Worked at CBS for a bit, uh, saw a job over at NBC in Milwaukee. They were hiring, uh, kind of starting up like a remote graphic sub operation for general broadcast group. Uh, so I ended up taking a job there and working for uh, KTMV, the Las Vegas ABC station. It's actually who I was working for full time just from Milwaukee. Um, that job was rough, just the hours of uh, 4 p.m. to 1 a.m. Were, were real rough. And then all your coworkers being, you know, a thousand miles away, you don't really know anybody or talk to anybody. So that was a, that was a tough gig. Uh, but, you know, we did some pretty cool work there when I was at that station. Uh, jumped from there to WISN. I loved WISN. That was Hearst, uh, ABC in Milwaukee. Really great people. Uh, it was a station that I grew up watching. So to have a chance to work there was uh, really meant a lot to me. I uh, worked there for about a year before uh, their graphics hub at Hearst started up and I had to look for something new. Uh, so I ended up out at KTVU in San Francisco. So not a bad place to, to rebound after losing out in WISN. Uh, KTVU was an interesting gig. I was out there doing the, um, it was like a regular graphics graphic artist, production artist for about a year or so before I got promoted to art director and got to oversee the look of the station and, and marketing and that stuff. Did that for about three and a half years, jumped to WCCO in Minneapolis. I think, you know, those who are watching the show and, and know creative uh, in local news knows, you know, for many years, CCO, that was like the gold standard of creative uh, for local news. It did some incredible stuff. Um, left that for WUSA in Washington, DC. Uh, Techno Station did their rebrand, as, as Jacob was saying, you know, took them a new logo and uh, fixed the morning show and uh, many other sh shows that came and went in the, in the short time that I was there, uh, you know, helped them navigate the switch to uh, working remotely through COVID, uh, redesigned their set in their newsroom, a lot of stuff packed into a very short amount of time. And then, uh, then Guida came calling out of nowhere. Uh, you know, this is a great story of uh, those of you who are listening who have been hit up by recruiters on LinkedIn and you get ghosted. And it happens so often where like a recruiter says, hey, let's talk and nothing ever happens. Uh, we as recruiter was like, call me, let's talk, you know, and I'm like, OK, let's see what this is. And I think within like two weeks, I had the job or something. It was it was it was crazy. It was a whirlwind tour. And we didn't want their new logo. And hey, I've done new logos. I know most of our station I've worked at. I mean, even KTV, we did. Um, we flipped from KICU to KTVU Plus, so that was a new logo there. And um, so I've done a lot of new logos, and now I've got two new logos on the air here in DC on two different channels, which is also kind of strange, but kind of cool to see that. You know, when you flip around the stage, you're like, hey, I made that, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm a PBS now, and uh, you know, this is kind of cool because I grew up watching this old house in Sesame Street, and you know, my favorite shows like America's Test Kitchen, and, and WETA does a lot of work with Ken Burns. Uh, 
and everyone knows Ken Burns and his amazing documentaries that he does, and Skip Gates with Finding Your Roots, which is an incredible show. It's a lot of fun to watch. Uh, you know, we've, we've got a lot of great concerts that we do. Uh, there's just, what I like the most about this job versus where I've worked in the past is there, everything's different every day, you know, where you have, you know, we've got PBS News Hour, but we've also got lifestyle cooking. We have a, a, a show on our local channel that uh, guesses the prices of homes that are for sale in the, in the market and kind of takes you on a tour of neighborhoods, you know? So it's, it's a bit of everything that's kind of cool because you don't really know what the future is going to hold. You know, we've got great documentaries that come through and those topics are wide ranging. Uh, so it, it's a really exciting place to work. So you mentioned KTVU's relaunch. Uh, kind of talk about what was it like doing that? And then also going from, I think you mentioned to us, you were there when the station went from Cox to Fox. What was that like? Uh, that was really tough. Um, I remember the day, the day that, I, that they announced it, I was actually out to lunch in the city with a coworker of mine. And we took an Uber back to the station and we got out of the car and all these SUVs had rolled up to the station and folks were getting out and, and walking into the station. And this email goes out saying, you know, everybody meet in Studio B at you know, like 2.30 or whatever. And what's this going to be? And the GM walked in, uh, Trevor Pony, one of the best GMs I've ever had, just sweetest, smartest guy. Uh, he walks in with this big box of, of papers and I thought, oh, Tom is retiring. This is, this is it, you know, uh, kind of a bummer. But uh, no, the box was full of like HR information for all of us who were switching to our new employer. Uh, it was just all the new details of, of the Fox takeover. Uh, my heart kind of sank a bit just knowing, you know, Fox has a graphic sub that they run out of, of Tampa. Um, I had seven designers, you know, on, on the team at KTVU. Uh, I knew that there was no way we were going to get to keep any of them, you know, once, once this deal went down and you know, we were going to lose some of our unique identity that we had. And, and I did what I could. And, and, you know, we had a great uh, creative service director, Steve Poitras. Um, it was his second uh, term at KTVU. And, and he had worked there in his heyday when KTVU was really a powerhouse station that was just known throughout the country. And the two of us were just kind of trying ways to, to work with Fox to maintain that unique identity that KTVU had. I mean, even the logo was on the table at the very beginning of, of you know, wanted to change that up. But, you know, what was nice was the folks at the Fox Graphics Hub um, were really open to ideas and um, didn't want to kind of force anything on us, really. The, a lot of what they were trying to do was just for the, the ease of consistency across the group and sharing assets and all that makes sense. I get that, you know. But they said to us, you want to make your own show opens, that's fine. As long as you support them, you, you maintain them that's on you. And, and, you know, we were happy to do that just to try to keep some of that unique Bay area KTVU history that, that we had, because again, you know, this is a very liberal market that it was. And, you know, you start throwing the red, white, and blue Fox stuff on the air. We were concerned about that and, and rightfully so. Um, so, you know, the day came and went and I lost my staff and eventually we changed to the Fox look and, and, you know, did that for a bit, just, you know, running that, uh, that station kind of on my own for a bit on the graphics side was, was tough. And, you know, I think I gave it about a year or so before I was looking to get out of that. Um, that, that was tough when I, my, uh, I was really happy when I got to that station, it was you know, to live in the Bay area and work at this incredible place. Uh, it was really a dream come true and, and it didn't end, uh, on the best of terms for any number of reasons. And that was, you know, disappointing, but, um, I've got a lot of good memories and I've made a lot of really great lifelong friends at KTV, which, you know, that there's, there's always something good to take away from something. And, and I take away those, those great relationships that I made from that job. Now let's talk about, um, WETA. You started there in 2020. What has it been like there so far? Well, it's been strange for me because I've never worked in the building. I've, I've been remote this entire time, um, working with the communications team at WETA. And uh, I, I imagine, you know, we probably wouldn't be in the office right now, except in addition to the logo redesign and everything else, we're doing, and we're remodeling the building. So if you go over to Campbell Place right now, which is just a couple of miles down the road from me, the building is completely gutted. Um, WET actually has two facilities. We've got the main Campbell Place building, which is where all the offices are. And there's a separate studio facility, which is a few blocks away. And that's where PBS News Hour is produced from in, in Washington Week. And uh, we kind of want to bring everything under one roof. So we're 
not only doing a remodel of uh, our building to make it look you know more modern, but we're actually expanding outward and upward to make studio space for those shows. So it's been a little bit strange working remotely, but you know we've had a few chances to uh, kind of get together and, and meet folks in person. And uh, you know, for me, it's creative is a, I don't want to say it's a vacuum, but it, you're kind of settled in a way where it's like, yes, you collaborate on ideas and concepts, but when it comes down to getting the work done. I'm not sharing a Photoshop file or an AfterX file with somebody. I'm working alone independently. And if I can sit quietly and just kind of hammer through these projects, um, it's been pretty great, you know, uh, to be able to kind of focus on, on the work uh, from here. And uh, who knew that you could rebrand a complete, you know, not just one station, but really it's, it's five TV stations and a radio station plus the corporate look, uh, you know, remotely. Uh, but I think we were, we're surprised that everything we can do remotely. We can do a whole newscast remotely now and, how crazy is that? I mean, um, Richard Diam of WUSA, I remember when we went remote, uh, he said, if we were going to do this pre-COVID, he said, it would have taken, you know, six years and consultants and a ton of money to figure out how you could do this job remotely. And to the credit of this industry, you know, a lot of stations pulled this off in like a week. And for the most part, a lot of stations did a pretty dang good job of putting together a remote newscast from, you know, producers scattered here and directors over here and reporters and anchors everywhere. It's unbelievable to think that we could actually do that now. And I think now it's been two years, we're kind of getting used to it, you know? How is public television different than local news? And if you had the chance, would you ever like want to go back into local news? Well, public television is different. I mean, I mean, like I was saying before, just the variety of content uh, is what excites me about it. Uh, you know, news is very cyclical. You, you know what's going to happen in terms of elections and just everything that goes on throughout the year. Um, and that gets old after a while. You know, you kind of do a lot of the same. That's why I have a lot of success going from station to station to station because it's really the same job everywhere you go. They do the same exact thing. The show is pretty much the exact same show. Some stations do more shows than others, um, but it's it's very easy, I think, to jump from one to the other. With this job at WIDA, um, I never really know what's going to happen next. And, and they try to ask me, like, well, if you, you know, do you want to add more people on or this or that? I don't know what the future holds because we've got a number of documentaries in the pipeline or new shows that pop up or, you know, it, it's, it's so... Um, you know, I, I think it's going to be a while till I'm kind of used to kind of what the cycle is at a public broadcasting station. Uh, but then, you know, there's just something to be said for the affinity that people have for your brand. I mean, I think everyone has a pretty solid, great opinion of public broadcasting and, and that has played some kind of role in their life at some point, be it, you know, like a kid watching, you know, Sesame Street or Arthur, Arthur being my favorite <clears throat> show, you know, when I was a kid or the, the cooking shows that they had, if it was Julia Child, you know, uh, just all those great legacy shows that, that they've had. And then to be a part of that, especially WETA, who admittedly, I did, was not aware when I came on board of, of, you know, how deep WETA's roots were into the public broadcasting system. And uh, to be on board with this team and, and the shows that we produce, uh, it's, it's really an honor. You know, I mean, we just did in December, um, a performance at the White House, uh, Spirit of the Season. It was a, a concert that we filmed at the White House with the Jonas Brothers and, and uh, Camilla Caballo, and it was hosted by Jennifer Garner, and we had the president and first lady. I, I mean, you don't get to do that kind of stuff in local news. Um, but I, I can thank my local news background for being able to turn creative around quickly because that show came up quick and we had to get it produced and designed quick and on the air fast for the holidays. Uh, and that local news background that I had for design and marketing really helped to kind of formulate that. As to the second part of that question, when I go back to local news, that's, um, I, I don't know. Um, you've had a lot of guests on, because you know, I'm an, uh, an avid watcher of your podcast in addition to being on it today. And there's a lot of folks who, who have left the business and, and for good reason, there, there are still some issues in local news that need to be addressed with some of the toxic environments that are out there there or just some of the dated ways that they approach content and marketing. And if, if there's a station out there that ever takes that seriously or actually takes the word innovation seriously, um, I would be absolutely interested, but uh, I'm not seeing that at this time. So, and of course I just lost the earbud. That was gonna happen. Uh. Do you feel like standardization at most commercial broadcasters held you back when you worked in local news? 
No, I, I wouldn't say so. I, I would say there were chances to express yourself at all the places I worked at. Um, <clears throat> you know, whether or not the graphics hubs that I worked with appreciated it or not, it's a different story. But, um, you know, there, there was never really a time when someone said that I couldn't do something or, or strip the limits of, of something. For example, if you look at, um, uh, like back at WUSA, uh, Get Up DC, um, that look doesn't look much like the rest of, of the Tegna look and what, what the other stations are doing. But we found, we pulled threads of that graphics package into the, into the Get Up show in terms of colors and some of the patterns and textures and stuff. I worked on that with uh, Jeff Steed at Hot House Creative. Um, really good friends of mine, them and John Fox, uh, place out of Dallas, just to kind of give that show uh, just a, a different kind of look and style and energy that, that most local newscasts in the morning didn't have. I mean, we had a comedian as the host. I wanted something that's just a little bit more rougher around the edges. The Tegna look, which I'm sure you're familiar with, was, was very clean and, and, and fine lines. And so, you know, we kind of took this, this messy comedian morning coffee stain thing and these kind of clean lines and bright colors and brought them together. And I think we had a, a kind of a nice hybrid look that actually was so well received a couple of the stations stole it and <laughs> used it on their morning shows so that's how you know you're doing something right is when people steal your work so the reason why we have you on in the first place why did weta want to rebrand many reasons um all of them you know kind of just colliding at the same time one being what i just mentioned the uh the, the rebottom of campbell place our, our, our facility here in uh Arlington, virginia uh, we're, we're doing a comp almost a ground up uh, of this building, signage, everything. So uh, that was one reason to look at the logo. Um, the logo is at least, uh, I forget what they were saying, it was 25 or seven years that they've had this logo, which is pretty long for a broadcast. And I think you're going to look at places like networks, like CNN and NBC kind of can pull it off. But local stations tend to not have that going for them. Um, the other big thing was uh, PBS uh, did a rebrand in 2019 and they had a lot of uh, new guidelines for, for what they call co-branding with, with their logo and the station's logo. And uh, we wanted to kind of meet those guidelines. And so we wanted a logo that would hold up really well next to theirs. You know, obviously we want that PBS brand and that legacy, but we don't want to forget that we is also very important and a very known commodity here in the DC area. So two logos that would work side by side together very well. PBS also was changing up the color palette. So we wanted to kind of work within that too, you know, and then just uh, the usability of our old logo. Um, obviously we're growing in these digital spaces and the frustrating thing that you find is if you're on Facebook or, or, or Instagram, that like your profile icon is like that big, you know? So our logo didn't really scale great with the claws on the sides of it. So we wanted to make our letters uh, a lot bigger, taking out a lot more presence on those smaller spaces or, you know, you look at like a, electric program got them like direct tv or something you know our logo was getting kind of small so uh, we wanted to sort of maintain that legacy of, of black white red and, and the wheat of ribbon but we really wanted to give those those letters a lot larger and so we were able to you know accomplish that with with this lovely logo that you see right here <laughs> so when did the rebranding process begin what was that like it began in july of 2020 uh one no when did i start 20, 2020 um about a month after i started at, at weta it, it began um we were going to look at some outside agencies to kind of do the work for us you know we obviously had a lot of research and a lot of fun of what we wanted um but me and my ego didn't want to let this opportunity slip through our hands and i just said well can i try a couple of stabs at the logo myself before we go out to the public, you know, and, and kind of solicit some bids because we had this really good RFP written up to go out to agencies and say, here's what we want, what can you do for us? Um, so I made a few attempts my July 4th weekend and uh, my boss uh, liked a lot of them. Uh, that kind of kicked it off where it was like, well, I kind of dug my own grave there. Now I got to do it. So instead of having an agency uh, kind of shepherd this thing for us, it kind of fell on my shoulders and, uh, did I bite off more than I could chew? Absolutely. Uh, was it a great learning experience? Absolutely. You know, uh, I mean, I've done rebrands before, uh, but never to the degree of, of what this was. And just, you know, unearthing all the little satellite parts of WIDA that, you know, throughout this process. Because again, it's not just this, it's, it's 
we have PBS and kids and world and we have a radio station and learning media companies. It's, it's just such an expansive company. We have a national productions arm that does documentaries and films. And, and then it's just, it goes deeper than the logo. It's, you know, what are our colors? What are our fonts that we use on things? How do we stay consistent in, in, in this stuff? So it's, it's not only just developing the look and the logos, but the, the guidelines of how to use them. And if you make letterhead, how big is the logo on the letterhead? And if you do an email signature, what is that format like? And um, you make a lot of it up as you go along, you know, but uh, it's all for, for the greater good. I mean, consistency with the, within a brand is incredibly important. I mean, you want people to be able to look at something from the organization and have those contextual clues that that's a weird thing to be in the color or the design or whatever it is that it doesn't have to be so blatantly, you know, our logo in front of your face to know that this is a weird thing. You can give those subtle clues. And, you know, the thing that we're exploring right now is uh, sound design. Um, we've never really had a WIDA sound. I mean, I think those who, I mean, you, you both said you watch Arthur, so, you know, GBH has had that classic sting before their show. So the back of the day, the, the orange glowing logo. Uh, everyone, I think, if they heard that, if they're familiar with public broadcasting, those, that's that study GBH in Boston. Um, PBS in 2019 in their rebrand, they explored mnemonic devices and how they've got one that pops up before each national show that you've probably heard. So we wanted to get in that arena as well and, and not just to tag our local or our national shows with, but you know, top of the hour IDs and on radio. And you know, we're talking now with our music composer about uh, We Did UK is one of our most watched channels. And We Did UK hosts a lot of uh, uh, mysteries and, and crime shows and dramas from, from England. Uh, so, you know, what if we take this WIDA sound signature and have a kind of a UK mystery version of it done for promo and stuff. So we really want to get this, this WIDA sound in people's heads. So now when they hear that, that several note signature that they, that they think of us. Uh, so that's been a fun place to play in. And it's, you know, learning about how many notes is WIDA? Is, is it a four note thing? Is it a six note thing? And, and does it sound like strings or pianos or, or horns? And we're working with, um, Stephen Auto Music out in Dallas, and you couldn't ask for a better partner to kind of walk us through that. I mean, they've done, you know, work with all the major networks and, and they understand what we're looking for and they can kind of guide us through that process. So that's been a lot of fun to work with them and kind of explore what our audio identity is going to be. So you mentioned biting off more than you can chew. So what exactly went into making that logo? And why would you say, you know, you bit off more than you can chew with that? Well, it, it's just, it's it's a lot for a very small team to, to kind of take this on. You know, if you would have gone to an agency, you would have had a team of folks who could throw ideas at it and uh, concepts and then work on this night and day. Uh, for me in, in you know, for the first half of it, it was just me. I didn't have a designer. I hired a designer, you know, toward the end of my first year, but for the big chunk of it was just me doing it. And then working on this logo while running the day-to-day -day of, of WBPA's design operations, you know, getting our other shows and documentaries and marketing pieces on uh, on the air or, you know, the bus stats, we were doing all that kind of stuff. Uh, so it was, it was a lot. It wasn't overwhelming, but it was just a lot, a lot to take on. And then just, you know, not really knowing the scale of what it was going to be until this thing kind of got in front of us like okay well there's a lot of logos here there's a lot of ancillary pieces of of you know marketing pieces and we do a ton of direct mail pieces to membership and just things that you know, we, we do a monthly magazine and the logos ever in the magazine so you know this this stuff was just collecting over time of like well there's a lot here but you know luckily the folks that we do like they had their game faces on. Everyone kind of had their own roles and responsibilities. And what just blew me away, we launched this logo on January 2nd. And I was actually driving uh, either to or from Minneapolis, I can't remember. Um, and I, I thought I'd be, you know, on the phone all day or doing emails all day. Of, oh, we didn't do this. This thing is missing. I need this or whatever. 
I did not get one phone call. I did not get one email. They just launched it. You know, everyone had their role to do and they just did it. And at 6 a.m. on January 2nd, the bug flipped over to the, to the new logos on all five channels and the website flipped the day before and, and PBS, you know, over on there and they flipped our app over. Everything just worked really nicely, really seamlessly. So this was um, one of the smoothest transitions I've ever worked on. And there are still things we're working on, you know, like getting the letter head together and getting the brand guidelines out to folks to get email signatures figured out and stuff. But I mean, we're only a couple of weeks in. The last logo lasted 27 years. You know, we're a few weeks in. We'll get there. So we see the new logo, it's on your shirt. So what was the, <laughs> so what was the thought process into the new logo? Were you trying to kind of keep, uh, you don't want to jar viewers with the new logo, right? Too much because it, I noticed it does look v pretty similar to what you guys had previously. Yeah. You, you know, it's a bit of a callback to, to Wida's legacy. You know, we've got a really strong legacy here in the district. And, uh, you know, the ribbon has been a part of our visual language for a while. And, and in this new look, I wanted to make the ribbon really more integral into our look. And you'll see that, excuse me, as, as our logo and our, and our, brand, our brand collateral rolls out, you'll see the ribbon reflected a lot more in, in the pieces that we're producing. Um, the other thing was just we had this really heavy serif typeface for WVTA that didn't really scale well. It kind of filled in as it shrank down in print and digital. So we wanted to keep a, a nice, classy serif font, but something that also had a bit of a modern edge to it. And the problem that we had was I wasn't finding a ton of fonts out there that existed already that were meeting those criteria for us. So this is actually a custom letter set that I've designed. I've never done this before. I've never made letters, uh, just these fonts, you know, for my entire career. So to, to make letters and, you know, you can see like on the W, to, like, to add points in the W and what size are they and to play with the weights of the, of the legs of the W and, you know, how far does this middle part of the E go out and how far does this E go out? Just all these little things about typography. Like that's, you know, when I talk about biting up more than you can shoot, like that's a good example right there. And I learned so much about, uh, typography in, in doing it. It was a lot of fun. Uh, and then, you know, trying to find, you know, we're working with these guidelines of PBS of how we can balance our logos together and try to work. And we want to keep this nice, big red wheat ribbon, but there wasn't a ton of, you know, uh, space to work with under our logo. So this idea of tucking it in behind the A and kind of flaring it up to give us just a little bit more, you know, red presence on screen to help our logo stand out. I mean, that was almost like a, that came pretty late in the process of, you know, trying to figure out like, how do we get this right in there? Um, just, it was just a random idea that I had. I mean, I, I did hundreds of logo concepts for Wida and, and some were aggressively modern and contemporary and some were very similar to what we had, you know, from the nineties. Um, this is a nice hybrid, I think, of, of, of both of them. It's a nice compromise of, of you know, modern contemporary design and that 60 year legacy that WIDA has. And, and WIDA's, you know, it is so much more than just a local broadcaster at DC. It is that national productions arm. It is the, you know, we host a lot of events uh, in, in DC. We are essentially a cultural institution in this area. Um, so, you know, there's a few different uh, legacies to own up to there. And I think this local kind of captures all of them. So what was like the final, well, I don't want to say final, you're still working on it, but like, what does the rebrand consist of? What all did you make? Like, what's like, how, like how big is like the graphics and like all the logos and stuff like that? Sure. I mean, yeah, that's a big project and it, it, it's, it scales, you know, from channel to channel and on what you do. I mean, obviously the website is as well on social media. Those have all of their own as well. But I mean, let's just start on channel 26.1, our, our main PBS channel. Uh, we were keeping uh, the PBS graphics package that they had designed with Lippincott back in 2019. Um, they did this really nice blue package that we were keeping. So that was more or less just a straight update. You know, we were already using it 
We're just going to swap out, you know, logos on that channel. That, that wasn't a, a big lift. Uh, the biggest lift was We the UK. And We the UK sometimes is, is more watched in this market than PBS. There's a lot of really great shows on that channel. Um, that logo had been around for quite a while as well. I wanted to give that some, you know, a really unique identity to, to UK. It had a pretty clever logo that took the K and kind of referenced the Union Jack in the design of the K, which I thought was really clever. Um, but I wanted to do something that was just a little more on the nose, obvious about, you know, what this meant, you know, and, and shows like Downton Abbey are really popular. Um, you know, that, that whole, people love the Royals. People love the Royal family, the Queen. They're really into that. So I designed a, a UK, which was actually based off of the old letter set and this new Wheat of Letter set. And you can kind of see, you know, these together. And then I just put a crown on it. It's this little kind of fun tilted crown to give this nod to the, uh, the royal family. And we're going to evolve this down the line by, you know, when we do a mystery night, we might put a, a Sherlock Holmes cap on it, you know. Um, so I, I think you're going to see this logo wear many hats, how many hats over time, just because there's a lot of fun things we can do with it. Uh, there's a lot of ways we can express ourselves creatively on Reading UK. So it was, it was the look of the logo. And then we actually did a full new package for the channel. Uh, promo graphics, uh, IDs, lower thirds. Uh, I really wanted to bring in the previous look relied heavily on this kind of misty, cloudy, rainy, very London kind of look. I wanted to bring in some more of the textures of the city with you know Big Ben and, and the Tower of London and then London Bridge, all those things. Um, so, and, and you can't ask for a more beautiful country to, to work with in terms of scenic. So it's so much great footage to work with. So UK was a lot of fun. Uh, a couple other stations were just simple, you know, update the logo, make a new animation for it. We don't, we don't Metro is our, our um, another PBS station that we run that it streams on YouTube TV. We're going with a little bit more of a contemporary style on that. You can see that reflected in, in the Metro logo. Uh, so, you know, did a quick animation design for that. So there's just a lot of pieces there. And, and luckily we've got a really big broadcast uh, team who was able to knock out redesigning all the existing promo inventory that we had across all five channels. It was a major lift on their part to, to make the January 2nd deadline. And then, you know, it's, it's get this, we, we produce um, a three second animated logo that gets attached to our national production. So if you watch uh, BBC world news on your local PBS station or Washington week or Test Kitchen or Petty's Mexican Table, you know, our logo appears on those shows. So we have to get that logo in the hands of the companies that produce those shows. Uh, our own local productions will win our logo. So there's just, it, it's got deep roots that you know, we found throughout time that we had to make sure, oh, make sure this person has it. You know, PBS News Hour um, is produced at WETA. And, you know, make sure that, that even though it's the same company, you know, still got to talk to each other, make sure that they have it. Because again, we're remote. And to try and make sure that everyone's on the same page remotely, um, added another whole layer of stress to this project. But again, you know, this is WIDA. These are folks who've been there for a long time. They know what they're doing. They're, you know, they're dedicated to the, to the profession. Um, they made it easy. You know, I was worried about this not getting done um, or people, you know, kind of letting this logo slip their minds. It was on everyone's mind front and center on January 2nd, that's for sure. So you know, it will lift um, and as, you know, as, as Jacob was saying, still growing into it, you know, and, and the nice thing is, is we've kind of built this brand that will evolve over time, you know, we'll kind of grow into this logo and do new things with it, build upon this ribbon design. And, and it's kind of fun to see where this is going to take us. How has the look been performing so far? What's reaction been like both internally and from people in the community? Well, people love it. I mean, especially internally at WETA. Um, and, you know, for a designer, uh, for me, like I, I can never admit if I, if I do good work or not, I, I just, I'm awful at that. And most designers, they don't want to, you know, they're, they're all pretty modest, I, I would say. A lot of them are. Uh, but we took this logo on a bit of a road trip throughout WIA before we launched it and just kind of showed departments and said, hey, here's what we're doing. And I was admittedly concerned. I, I thought, like, are people going to think that this logo is not different enough or it's not contemporary enough or this or that? And I was kind of braced for, you know, any number of reactions. And it was universally positive. Um, and, and that really, you know, I'm excited about getting this thing up on air in, in January. You know, people just were excited to get this new logo into their publications and on social media. They just wanted this, this new presence and just to breathe some new visual life into some of the, of the things that they were doing. 
so it was well received and from the public you know i, I think same thing there it's it's just um you know it, it's a it's a, a nice refresh it, it's not a radical change it's it's not like we're saying we're the new weta we're the same station that you've always known and loved we've got the same program with the same faces and you know we're still that legacy that that's here for you just a little bit of a facelift you know a little bit of a botox here or there and uh and that's kind of all it was all right so let's say someone is listening and watching um and they want they want um to revamp their station brand or get graphics or new music stuff that you know that you've all had um experience with what should they know going into it you know make the process collaborative uh for any number of reasons i mean first off everybody wants to have, have a voice in, in some you know some degree with what you're doing and as they should everyone's a vested stakeholder in, in the product um but it's those folks that also help you unearth those those things that you don't think about the you know the thank you cards that need new logos or the uh number 10 window envelopes that need to be reprinted all those little goofy things or the the hidden sub brands that someone created that you didn't know about um you know you bring enough folks into this that'll really help you get this thing you know, up and running and, and just, you know, getting as much feedback as you can from those internal parties, I think is absolutely crucial to a successful rebrand. So your thoughts on local news design, obviously, is a lot of different styles. <laughs> <laughs> I know a lot of it, you know, some of it's 3D, some has gone flat, times have changed. Uh, so what do you think local news and I guess just local television in general should look like to attract younger audiences and stay relevant? Because I think a lot of TV stations, maybe they're kind of, you know, complacent with what they have. They're afraid to change. I mean, and that's absolutely true. There is a lot of that fear. It, you know, a lot of TV stations, GMs have a sales background and then their focus is the bottom line, the dollar and, and yeah, that's how you get paid. That's how you keep folks employed, and, that, and that's very important. But you know, there's um, there's a future to this business, and I can't tell you what it looks like. I, I know what I think it should look like, um, but no one's particularly interested in hearing that. So, uh, you know, the graphics and the set, all those visual pieces, the branding—that's just such a small part of it. Um, the content has to meet those expectations as well, and, and you know stations have to start really getting serious about making sure that that content lives up to the marketing, which often it, it, it does not. Um, you know, does does your talent look like the audience that you're going for? Are the stories representative of your of your market or the things that your people who are watching you want to hear? Um, you know, the hard part with local news, you know, the, uh, an over-the-air broadcast is it goes to such a wide audience, uh, whereas a lot of the younger people in the audience, myself included, we want hyper local content. Uh, and it's tough if you're, you know, working for a local station, you have to cover 10 or 12, you know, counties or, you know, here in the DMV, you got DC, Maryland, Virginia, you got to cover a wide area uh, for news. You know, it's, it's tough. I, I think the, um, the biggest gap that's missing though, it's not so much the, the on-air piece, which, does have some some growth that needs to get done. Um, it's the digital piece. Uh, a lot of TV station websites and apps just are a bit of a black hole for content. Um, you know, you see a breaking news story that, that pops up on online and there's like one sentence there. It says, this is developing. And you go back like three hours later, it's the same thing, you know. Um, a lot of local station digital staffs are very small. And a lot of the time, they're just kind of copying and pasting scripts onto the website because you don't have time to search out their own stories and make interesting stuff, you know? So it's, it's, it's tough, you know? I mean, you got to staff up websites don't make a ton of money. So I get that too. You know, I mean, you're selling banner apps and half the time those are just, you know, added value to somebody they're not paying for them. So it's, it's, it's tricky. Um, but, but content is, is one of the bigger issues as well. And, you know, one of the station groups I worked at was really big on kind of trying to modify you know, what a local newscast looked like. But the problem was they would focus on one story a night. So, you know, you're talking about two to three minutes of your show reflects your brand. The other 20, four minutes doesn't, you know, it's the same thing. You know, if I were to watch any of the other three stations in town, I'm going to get the same exact content aside from those three minutes. I don't know. It's, 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 it's tough. You know, I, I'm dying to see some true innovation out there and I'm excited for it. I'd, I'd hate to see local news, you know, 
go the way of a newspaper where it's consolidated and then it's, you know, it, it's bland. Uh, I would love to see some true innovation in, in local news. Um, it's just going to take guts. It's going to take, you know, someone to step up and say, you know, this is what we should be doing. And, and it's going to be different. You know, if, if you watch a newscast from 1982 and you watch a newscast from 2022, uh, they're going to feel very identical from the greeting of the anchor at the top of the show to when they toss the weather and the banter and when they do sports and if they run some packages and even how the shots are framed and the, the fact that they've been doing over the shoulder these days with the graphics, you know, um, it's time for a real big kick in the pants. I don't know what that is, and I, and I but I, I'm, I'm anxious to see somebody do it, and I hope it happens soon. You did say that you you think people don't really want to hear your thoughts on what local news should be. But now I'm curious, what is your, <laughs> like, you, you, you're just asking for me to ask you, what is like your ideal future station? Like what's the newscast? Like, how does it look? How does it sound? What type of stuff are they covering? Well, you, you know, I'm thinking that the future of a local newscast isn't this linear, you know, a three minute broadcast that comes on at 11 o'clock or in your market or whatever it is. I think it's similar in a format to the way of the podcast where, you know, this, this show is as long as it needs to be based upon the content that you have for the day. Um, I don't know that the medium is necessarily television in terms of how it's delivered. You know, the, the problem that you see right now is that if, if a local station covers a singular story, that same exact story goes in three different places in the exact same format. It goes on the digital on the website, it goes under the social page and it goes on to you know, goes on the air. But maybe some shows are interesting to somebody and might be interesting to be put on digital. Uh, maybe some are meant for the app, you know, meant for a push notification, and maybe some are truly meant for broadcast, some great, you know, storytelling that's going to, you know, tug at the mind, pull the heartstrings, that kind of stuff. Um, but right now it's a bit of a yard sale. You know, everything just kind of goes into these pots and, you know, you hope people are interested and if they're not, you know, whatever, but I, I, you know, the division of where the content goes is important, you know, because a newscast is going to start, you know, at the top of the show with the house fire and whatever neighborhood. And if you're in the neighborhood, yeah, it's a big deal. It's a house fire in the neighborhood. That's a big deal. But if I'm, you know, 46 miles away, I don't care, you know, and it's callous and cold, but I really don't. Um, so maybe, you know, some of those stories are meant for the web and then put it there. And, you know, ideally, one of the things I'd love to see um, is a local news app uh, from a station. That whenever they post a story online, they're adding you know a geolocation to it, so I can have this app ping me whenever a story happens within a mile of my radius, and I can get that push notification and say, "Okay, this is happening right here, right now. I'm interested." You know, or you know, even just certain keywords of things that I'm really interested in. These are basic fundamental things that you could do with an app or the local news website but nobody does them um start there you know start with just some innovative things to get people's attention you know i mean the pages that i follow the most for local content now are the neighborhood pages that tell me when the restaurants are closing or opening or what new stores are coming to town or you know just these goofy little things that happen on the street you know in, in my area um there's no reason you can't cover those in a major local news operation but doesn't have to be on air. It can be a web only thing. Got to step up your web team though to, to make that happen. So, you know, I'd like to see the shows be a little more conversational in terms of, you know, bring some guests on, look at what cable news does. You know, it's, it's talking heads and, and yeah, that, that's not the best thing for some folks, but it's clearly that's where the eyes are. You know, the controversial thing that I would say is, and I might regret saying this, but I think at some point you got to look at the model of cable news and what's working right now. And maybe local news has to take a side. You, know, you might have to take uh, a stance with a party and, and recruit an audience through that way. And this sounds awful. It's against all the fundamentals of journalism, but you know, you can tell me all the research is out there that we, we want this, you know, we, we want the centrist local news cast, you know, we, we, we want the, uh, you know, like your news nation type thing where it's a down the middle. Folks don't want that. They, they want to, you know, be reassured with the, with the feelings and things that they have. And 
I, I think, you know, local stations can buy into that too. Okay, so for those who want to work in the creative side of television, what's your advice to get started? Well, let me just say first, that's where the fun happens. I mean, working in a newsroom is great, and, you know, you can work in sales if you want. I don't know how much fun that is, but um, every station I've worked at, creative is kind of the heart and soul. Like, that's just where all the fun happens at the station. Um, I think, you know, obviously we're seeing the business shrink in many different ways, um, so they're, the jobs are harder to find. Uh, and what really does well for you uh, are folks who are a bit of a jack of all trades. If you can write and produce and shoot and edit and do design, you know, those are the folks who are really thriving right now in you know, creative services. You kind of got to be a bit of a jack of all trades when you get into business. Because it used to be where you could get a job and just be an editor or just be a photographer. Um, you really can't do that now. You kind of have to have a bit of a background in everything to be successful. Um, I mean, for me, I started out just being a designer and that probably was fine back then, but now I, you know, somebody had to learn how to write some basic copy or come up with media campaigns or strategy or, I mean, and even the whole world of social strategy, which is just a whole other beast to deal with. You're going to have some idea of how to contend with that, you know? So, I mean, the more that you can arm yourself with walking in, the better. And then it's just also about, not getting complacent with your knowledge. Uh, you know, for me, working with the Adobe software, Photoshop, Illustrator, and this all this stuff, that stuff's changing to some degree, you know, every once in a while they're, they're updating the software, there's new things to learn. Uh, stay on top of it. I mean, I can't tell the number of designers I've worked with who never learned motion graphics and you're working in television, you know? Um, so just, just stay on top of trends, see what else is out there in the business. You know, for me, it was, you know, I, I um, I'm self-taught with uh, almost everything that I've, that I've learned in terms of the creative software, but even with the industry itself, it's, you know, you go on vacation and you watch another local station in that town and see what they do and how they do it. And you know, it's kind of how you pick up on these little trade secrets and details. So it's, it's, you kind of have to be, uh, you gotta be invested and willing to put the time in, you know, and, and um, for the, in the beginning for me, this was never a nine to five job. It was odd hours and it was, you know, spending time on the weekends, you know, honing my skills and learning new things, just trying to make myself more marketable. And I think through all that, I was able to kind of build this great career that, you know, has, that I've been able to, I've been very lucky to thrive in. So you just, you really have to be invested in, in what you're doing. I mean, this, this really, it, the people who kind of treat this as like a nine to five job and walk away from the end of the day, yeah, you can do that. You know, that's, that's fine. But if you want to thrive, you've really got to be invested in what you're doing. So for someone who wants to get into creative services, what kind of background would someone need? Because let's say someone wants to go to college for this, and I, I'll admit I even want to work in creative services for a while, but I'll look at like LinkedIn's or resumes of several creative services, producers, CSDs, and they just have like, say, a broadcast journalism degree. Obviously, you're probably not learning after effects there. So where do you even learn the skill set yeah. for all this from? Are a lot of people self-taught maybe? You know, I, th I think some are, you know, when I worked in Milwaukee, I found a lot of folks there had a film degree background from UWM. Um, and that's where they'll learn some basics on, you know, lighting and, and, and shooting and everything and that kind of stuff. And, you know, Milwaukee also had um, MATC, which actually runs the public broadcasting stations, Channel 10 of 36 WMBS in Milwaukee. Um, they had a, a really great, really strong video production course that you could learn from there. But these days, I mean, you can learn so much stuff online. Uh, you know, there are so many great tutorials on, you know, LinkedIn or Skillshare or even just YouTube. Um, you know, it's funny. We used to shoot a lot of promos, uh, obviously, on, on DSLR cameras when I was at, at CBS here in D.C. And it's a lot of work. It's futzy getting everything set up with the lighting and this and that. And there were days where I would just pull up my iPhone and shoot some B-roll and it would look just as good, <laughs> you know. So work with the tools you have. I mean, you can do some great stuff with an iPhone if the audio quality is pretty good, you know? Um, I, it's I, self, being self-taught, it's a blessing and a curse because everybody wants to know, like, well, how'd you do it? What are you, what'd you do? And I really can't tell you. Just a lot of nerding out. Just a lot of spending time reading manuals and, and taking things apart. You know, my, my first TV job uh, was looking for a cable access station in West Dallas. And... I walked in on day one and my boss said, here's all the stuff. I don't know what it does. He was the, he was the um, public relations 
guy for the school district. He wasn't a tech guy, but all the gear was under his team, you know, his department and in a closet off of his office. He's like, if you can figure it out, more power to you. And so I walked into this back closet room and it's all these racks of gear and broadcast equipment. And they're broadcasting a live TV signal under the cable system. And I just started playing with stuff, you know, just sort of putting tapes in the VCRs and pressing buttons on these computers. And, you know, within a week I had a full 24 hours worth of programming on this cable channel, you know, um, but I had to invest the time and just goofing around, you know, with, with this stuff. And, uh, you know, just like with that graphics package for the CBS station, that was down awful that I did. Uh, there'll be some missteps along the way, obviously, you know, but, you know, obviously you do learn from those mistakes and, and you got to make some along the way. Um, but uh, you just don't let them hold you back. You know, I, I mean, I have designed tens of thousands of things over my career, you know, and they're not all going to be award winners, <laughs> you know, um, but, uh, you know, this might not be the one, but maybe the next one will, will be that that great piece. You know, just always keep looking forward to that to that next thing. Uh, just try not to you know flame out, try not to lose the burn, the drive. Um, and it can happen in creative. I mean, because you're really exercising some pretty intense brain muscles every day. And if you're you know a creative director or an art director, you know you're jumping from project to project to project throughout one day, and it's it's, it's like you know driving a car down the freeway and just sliding in the reverse and, you know, just stripping all the gears sometimes. And that puts a lot of strain on your, on yourself mentally. So, you know, maintaining a healthy work-life balance. I, I can't stress that enough. I didn't do that for a lot of years and, and that was not great for me. And, and I'm much better at that now. So I just, you know, implore those who get into this business to just, you know, take care of yourself too, mentally, physically, because uh, it can get away from you pretty quick. So Dylan, you do you do some freelance work. Um, how's that going? And also, what are some of the projects you're doing uh, for your freelance gig? So a lot of designers do a lot of freelance work on the side. I um, work with Clorox on a lot of social pieces that, that they do. I, I just did um, a, a graphics package for AAA, uh, the automotive company. Uh, they, you know, what you're finding is uh, a lot of brands want to get into video. You know, you've got a social channel, you've got YouTube, you've got Twitter. Um, a lot of these legacy companies don't have video production departments, so they need a graphics package. And that's where a guy like me can come in handy, where it's like, oh, this guy, you know, he can do a, an open for AAA's new travel show on, on, on their YouTube series, you know. Um, and, you know, just going back to the other question about, you know, you want to get a start in creative services, uh, don't limit yourself just to, to local TV stations or, or TV networks. I mean, most companies out there have some need for video creative. I've got a friend who works for this company in Milwaukee. They're called Brady and they make like label maker systems for, for, for companies, you know, like for, I don't know how to label like a tube or a pipe or something like that. And he works in the video department, creative services department there, just making, you know, safety videos and, and marketing videos. And so a lot of companies have that need. Um, and a lot of companies pay pretty well to do that stuff. So uh, you know, if you want to make lower thirds, you can do them for any number of companies aside from just local news stations. So ending on a lighter note, uh, Dylan, favorite restaurants in DC. So I'm sure DC has got a lot of mm. options. What are your recommendations there? If people find themselves in the nation's capital. Well, you know, it's tough for me because I moved here and then COVID happened after a little bit. Um, my hangout for a long time, and I'm not saying you should go here, but my hangout was Cleveland Park Bar and Grill. I'd go there every night after work for, for drinks and bar food. Um, if you want a really good brewery, though, with some great brunch, and they've got these, like, cube tater tots that are really good. It's called Blue Jacket. They're in, uh, I think, like the Navy Yard area. I live in Alexandria now um, across the river, and Old Town Alexandria has some, you know, some great restaurants. I went to this really fun old school Italian place called Joe. Oh, Forget all that. The place you need to go, uh, Taco Rock. There's a couple locations. There's one in Alexandria here. The best taco I've ever had. They've got this one. It's puffy beef. It's this puffy tortilla shell, ground beef, uh, some nacho cheese, and then a dusting of like uh, flaming hot Cheetos. You know, they have great cocktails. If you come to town, go to Taco Rock. They've got some pretty good stuff there. And then you're from Milwaukee originally. So, 
any any good breweries there? Well, I mean, Miller obviously has a, a, a place close to my heart. Um, uh, a, a really good friend of mine uh, works at Miller Brewery. I've been on my tour several times. Uh, Miller High Life is my, uh, you know, my absolute favorite beer. I've got the coaster sitting right here. Um, but uh, Milwaukee's got a ton of breweries. Lakefront Brewery is, is a big one there. I mean, I feel like since I moved away in 2013, that a bunch more have opened. But, you know, of all places uh, for beer, when I lived in Minneapolis, uh, there were, I think, no fewer than 10 craft breweries within walking distance from my apartment. And they were incredible. Like, Indeed, uh, Modest, uh, Fulton, inbound I, I can go on and on there are so many of those my favorite though and the nerds amongst us group love it bad weather brewery uh in st paul uh really cool name really great beers really cool design on their cans um you know if you're in st paul i would say check out bad weather what is your favorite color blue and then where were you born I was born in West Allis, Wisconsin, home of Liberace. How many siblings do you have? I have an older brother and a younger sister. Um, both of them have spouses or kids or whatever, and I got the dog, so I think I'm the winner there. What hobbies do you have in your spare time? Next question. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, you know, I, uh, you know, I'm into. Um, making craft cocktails, that's a fun thing for me. Um, I'm starting to get into cycling a little bit, but I'm not in the best shape, so it's really kind of a nightmare, but I'll, I'll get there someday. <sighs> you know, I used to do photography, not so much anymore, but uh, you know, my half the time is spent with my dog who, you know, he went blind this summer, so it's just me and him kind of going on hikes and hanging out and watching TV. If, if TV can be a hobby, then I'll check that box too. You have any pets? <laughs> yeah, this guy right here who is uh, taking a nap um, somewhere over here. <laughs> Favorite TV show? Favorite TV show of all time would probably be The Simpsons. I love The Simpsons. And then of right now, uh, Ted Lasso. I really like Ted Lasso. Favorite type of music? Really into alternative rock. Uh, Foo Fighters would be my favorite band. And behind them would be The Killers. Favorite movie? Uh, cool Hand Luke which, oddly enough, as I'm sure you folks know, is also the birth of, of local news music as we know it. Uh, but it also just actually a really fantastic Paul Newman movie. Favorite book? I don't know if I have a, a favorite book, but a, a book that I've read that I think folks who work in media will love, uh, or find interesting at least, is uh, Bob Iger's autobiography, Right of a Lifetime. Uh, his experience uh, as a chair at, at ABC and at Disney and then the acquisitions of Pixar and, and Marvel and uh, a lot of great stuff to take away from, from that book. I would highly recommend anybody who works in the media uh, read that book. And finally, what's one thing that most people would be surprised to learn about you? <laughs> I'm not that interesting. Um, uh, I was almost a funeral director. That was almost the career path that I went down. Um, there was a history of that in my family and I kind of thought that would be a, a thing I would want to do. Um, but, uh, you know, I guess TV is slightly more interesting. So I kind of went down that path instead. All right, Dylan, where can people connect with you on social media? Oh, I hate social media. But if you want to find mm -hmm. me, uh, I, I do. You know what? I'll tell you where to find me. Follow my dog on Instagram. His name is uh, sutro.goodboy. Uh, that's where most of my social content goes inside of my dog's page. I got a Facebook. I don't look at it much. I deleted my Twitter a couple of years ago. I have an Instagram that I, I rarely use these days. Uh, I, I have found throughout the years, people don't care so much about you, the person, and your everyday life. But if you have a dog, look out. I mean, they want to see the photos, the videos, all the cutesy stuff. And so he has, for several years, now had have many, many more followers than I'll ever hope to have on social media. And, and rightfully so, he's adorable. So give my dog a follow. Maybe you'll see me pop up in there every once in a while. And then if somebody wants to hire you for work, where can they go? Uh, you can check out my website, wilburcreative.com. Um, I have not touched it in a long time, but maybe I should get on that one of these days. Um, 
but uh, I've got some really fun old projects there too. If, if you're a news nerd and want to see some old promos and some old graphics and uh, some set designs, there's there's some kind of cool stuff hidden on that site. So there you can check that out too. And then finally, anything that you wanted to add that we might have missed? Well, you guys did a good job. This was a really great interview. You had some really good questions. I, I hope I, I didn't just... Uh, burn a lot of bridges with my hate for local news but uh you know i'm not too worried about that either so <laughs> okay dylan thank you so much for for joining us um you're like our first creative services person we've interviewed so far so thank you we, we really appreciate it it was a lot of fun i mean you, you know it's um it, it's cool to see this podcast come together and, and you know to shine a light not just on the folks that are in front of the camera behind the camera too it's, it's really cool so you know again i'm honored that you that you asked me and um you know maybe i'll come back in a couple of years and have a whole new story for you so. <laughs> all right that's why we did it thank you dylan and thank you guys for watching or listening we'll see you next time bye the views and opinions expressed by the guests in this episode of Broadcast Bulletin are solely theirs. They do not reflect those of their past or present employers, nor those of Broadcast Bulletin or its hosts in any way. All right, so... Oh, yeah. I'm, running, I'm running out of bourbon here. Hang on, let me get, the, let me get a refill. Okay. <laughs>